Coming up, the New York football giants hire in a new special teams coordinator. The defensive coordinator position maybe could have some higher profile names to scout. We get word from Kayvon Thibodeau on how the locker room might feel about Saquon Barkley in this offseason. And of course, our championship round pick em battle continues. And it's all coming up next. <laughs> Ah, yes, my friends, it is OGP, the One Giant Podcast, where you know that we are your host over here, Adam Armbrecht, over there, Andrew Makowitz, a handful of delicious little nuggets around the New York football giants to get to. And then actually, frankly, Andy, we're going to be a little bit far afield here because the coaching carousel can tie back to Big Blue before we talk about Saquon Barkley and what is maybe another critical offseason for Joe Shane and the decision makers for the front office. That being the case, special teams, baby. You know we love to cook. You know that yours truly never forgets to mention them when we talk about all three phases of the New York football giants. Do you feel confident in going into the New York Jets coaching ranks to find the next special teams coordinator? Listen, I, I feel like it was just time for Thomas McGahee to go and like anyone else was going to be a better situation. Like if you're going to go out on the market and hire someone, you feel like you just needed a change of scenery. And so yep. I would be lying to you if I said I have the the full deep insight. I've been I've been tar targeting Michael Gobriel for quite a while. But what you find out is he's run his own special teams in college. He's <clears throat> been with the Jets for, I believe, three years now. The the Jets have been one of the better special teams uh uh units pieces, yeah, in, in the league. And so when you're grabbing someone from that tree. Doesn't have to really go too far across the building. I'm sure that they've crossed paths with him a few times. I've heard nothing but good things that he puts in the work. You got to be excited. To me, it's just we needed a new voice in there because clearly things had gotten lost. If Gabriel is the guy that they believe in, then so be it. Yeah, I, I you know we talk about this sometimes too. Names that are higher profile, names that are front of mind, maybe former head coaches that have gone back now over the years into de defensive coordinator, offensive coordinator roles. You have a better sense of them, right? Or you feel like you have a sense of them. When it comes to special teams, let's be honest. You look at whether or not they look good on coverage when you watch them. You look at whether or not they have a good punter, whether that punter has directional kicking. And then, you know, you can relate it back to the Giants. The Scottish Hammer did show development year over year, right? Got a little bit better with his positional kicking. So there are things like that that can be indicative of a successful unit that can go out there and be an impact part of your game. And at a minimum, I think all we're looking for is don't be a detriment. And there were times based on personnel and otherwise that special teams was exactly that. They were a they were a neg net negative for the Giants. And when you're a team that's struggling to figure itself out throughout the year and dealing with injuries and everything else, that's what you can't have. Is, is looking at your punt unit, looking at your kick unit, right? Saying, hey, just make a field goal. Just have solid coverage. Don't give up big returns. Let's flip the field position. That's when you look at McGahee and you go, yeah, th that's why the change had to be made here. Yeah, there, there's just a bunch of critical errors that were made that you felt like you could have saw coming from further away than what they did. And and that's really the reason for the change. Like, think back to last season. Did we? Do you remember that time where we had Adoree Jackson fielding punts and getting injured when he's our only best cornerback? Like, doesn't that ring a bell to you at some point? Well, let me ask you a question here before, because we're going to move on to more interesting, I think, conversation around defensive coordinator, the open spot for the Giants and some guys on the market, your head coaching news around the league as well. But from that aspect of it, the one component here now, whether or not it's communicating up the chain of command, whether or not McGay, he was, you know, of the mind to say, yeah, I can make it work with anybody or the other way that this goes, which and we, we talked about this in season, Joe Shane, Giants front office hey, you seem to make a lot of active choices where the players that were going to be performing on special teams were either not qualified, hadn't done it in a decade, right? So there is this other part of it where, yes, the coaching can be good, the scheming of it can be good, but you also need to have an understanding going up the chain of command here. What you can't saddle me with is either a rookie running back who's never really been in a position to be returning punts or kicks or have a guy on your roster like Jamison Crowder and maybe look at it and go, ah, we'll figure that out and dismiss a player that has value in a certain aspect of your team. Yeah, I, I, listen, I agree with that. But but here's here's the thing that kind of frustrates me a little bit about that is 
whenever things go awry, we seem to blame either John Mara or the front office for the decisions that are, that are made in terms of like, oh, Daniel Jones getting an extension. Clearly that came from John Mara. Like, oh, uh, you know, Adore Jackson Fields, not very good. Any, he was injured and he was our best cornerback last year. Not good. Oh, Eric Gray returning kicks. Never done it in his career. Not good. It must be the front office or the GM or someone else from above doing that. It's like, listen, if you're one of these coaches, you got there from like your work ethic, your grit, your determination, and knowing when to put people in the right situations. Like if Thomas McGahee did not believe Eric Gray should do it, or if Wing Martindale was like, this is too big of a risk of my defense for a Dory Jackson, they need to speak up and be able to say, I can't have this fall on me at the end of the day. Oh, yeah, sure. I, uh, yeah, that's fine. But like, again, Joe Shane, I can't have I can't have Eric Gray returning punts or kicks for me. OK, we'll see what we can do. Seven weeks later, you go out and you make a move and you see the impact that it had in the return game. Right. So, yeah, 100 percent. I think and this is what we talked about with Bobby Johnson. Right. Development of players. You can sit here and tell me you don't have the right personnel or that you need a different player X, Y, Z. Now, that's a little bit different because you feel like you have high draft capital invested in certain positions so you want to see the development based on the talent level right so there's a disconnect there and that's i think the only difference here is <clears throat> who's available to me what are my options right and if, the complaint, if the complaint got filed and it was ignored that's on joe shane if the complaint was never filed because you feel like these are the players that i'm working with then that's the other side of it so bottom line being giants pick up what we think is an improvement in that position on the coaching staff they improved we think offensive line coach as well so the offseason is going in the right direction from a coaching perspective that being the case the other opening on this team still is going to be the defensive coordinator role and it becomes a little bit interesting here andy because a funny thing happened on the way to bill belichick becoming the atlanta falcons head coach having total control having a very offensive uh, you know, talented side of the football and taking this team on a journey to a championship. They hired Raheem Morris, former interim head coach for the Atlanta Falcons. And the sentiment was that Arthur Blank wanted Bill Belichick, but over the course of the process, at a minimum, became open to other suggestions. And somewhere inside that building, they said, remember Raheem, Raheem Morris? What do you think? Maybe let's have a little discussion. Ultimately, it feels like this came down to a head coach in Bill Belichick with a track record that he has probably wanting speculatively here, wanting total control, right? To buy the groceries and set and set the table and make the meal versus Raheem Morris, who maybe was not going to be looking at getting a head coaching job, at least this off season, probably coming in saying, Hey, I'm a little more amicable. What do you like? Who do you want to keep? And I have some familiarity here. Well, think, think about the situation that you find yourself in where the Atlanta Falcons let go of Arthur Smith you bring in Bill Belichick and he's like, I want total control of everything in football. Everything. The buck stops with me. And you have guys like the CEO and President Rich McKay, who is a long-tenured, well-regarded executive in the league. And basically Bill Belichick comes in and is like, if I'm here, he doesn't tell me what to do. I tell him what to do on the football side of things. And it's like, there is this whole self-preservation piece of it. There, You have to be in a very unique position to take on someone like Bill Belichick as your head coach. You need to have turmoil in the front office you need to have a gm that maybe either just got fired or is a first-time gm that is looking for maybe help to transition into being mm -hmm. a full-time gm you can't have established front office looking for a head coach to completely turn things on its head and expect bill belichick to not like have what he's had over the last 20 years in new england 100 percent, right like so i i understand it from the atlanta side of things now the, the flip side of that coin might be <laughs> It's Bill Belichick. Like, give him whatever he wants. Like, your team has not been able to get over this hump. Maybe also, I think the divide there you can think about too being, well, we took Desmond Ritter as a mid-round quarterback. We still think he has upside. Belichick comes in and says, let's talk about how we get in a different quarterback here. Like, some, some foundational changes may not have been, you know, may have been a little bit too far for Atlanta. Even if it was, yeah, you want to give input. You want to have your opinion on who we draft or where we go and free agents. Sure but certain core things we want to keep in place and you're, and you're going to take us too far afield from that. And it feels like it probably opens up the door for our timeline to look further away from the playoffs than closer. And we actually think we're pretty close to making the playoffs in our division. Yeah. Well, the other thing that's interesting. So Raheem Morris, obviously the, the Atlanta was familiar with him. Dave Canales hired by the Carolina Panthers as yeah. their new head coach felt like it was kind of out of left field. Everyone's like Dave Canales, like what just happened? And then you hear that he was the quarterback coach for Geno Smith last year 
when Gino had his resurgence, then all of a sudden became the offensive coordinator in Tampa. Resurgence of Baker Mayfield. Clearly, he's had an impact on multiple quarterbacks. And if you are the Carolina Panthers, you have to figure out, number one priority, how do we get the most out of our, our number one draft pick, Bryce Young? Because if we don't get anything out of him, whatever coach is coming in is going to be gone in two or three years anyway. So let's oh, yeah. go with the young, you know, the young offensive mind who who seems to work well with quarterbacks. Because if we don't get it right, any head coach isn't going to be here for very long. <laughs> it really is perception, right? Like perception informs what you think. And if he was hired anywhere other than Carolina, you'd go, hey, hot commodity. Watch your backs, boys. Like, great track record. Carolina has just been such a mess, right? Now, hopefully it is the right move. Hopefully it helps a second-year quarterback who is, from a pedigree standpoint, one of the best prospects coming out of his class, hopefully helps get back on track. I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that in that regard. I just want to see young quarterbacks be successful because that's far more exciting than having to have those discussions about how, wow, looks like, you know, number one overall pick bust. Ugh, like that's a real tragedy. And if you're Carolina, you're willing, you're, you're willing to probably take a pretty big risk here to say, maybe this gets us a little bit closer to knowing what we have as opposed to being further away. Uh, agreed. And the, the interesting thing is, you know, we highlight the, the Atlanta job and the Carolina job because these jobs are filling up and we mentioned it uh, over on Twitter, like, Musical chairs are happening with really, really established veteran coaches, and there are not enough seats left in the head coaching positions for all of these people to get these head coaching jobs. Adam, there's only the Seattle Seahawks and the Washington Commanders left, right? So there's two spots, but you have coaches in waiting like Ben Johnson, who we expect that probably has the inside track to the Washington Commander job, and maybe Dan Quinn. Uh, up in Seattle just because he was there for the Legion of Boom, mm -hmm. familiarity with, with the entire organization. Feels like that seems like a good fit. If that's the case, both Mike Vrabel and Bill Belichick will be on the side, will not be on the sidelines coaching, will literally be on the figurative sidelines for this entire season, potentially. Do you see a world where either of them makes sense for the Giants coming in, knowing the Giants need a defensive coordinator, knowing that they're both defensive minded, you know, coaches? Where where are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, listen, we know that that Brian Dable and Bill Belichick have ties to one another. We know that Bill Belichick has ties to the Giants organization. We know that he has an affinity for the organization. If there was a world where where Belichick wanted to come in and be the defensive coordinator, why wouldn't you hire? Him? You'd be, I mean, you, you you'd be almost out of your mind because you'd be compartmentalizing him. Understanding when you talk about the Atlanta job, I want to come in. I'm going to be the head coach. Also, when I'm the head coach, I'm also the pseudo GM. That's fine, and you can have that debate and whether or not you want to do that. If you come in as defensive coordinator, you're already compartmentalized away from that. Now, you can still have, and you would want to have, hey, we're going to the draft. We're going to free agency. Bill, who are some players that you like, right? We, Of course, we want to fill your defensive side of the football with talent that you think is going to make sense. From a pure coaching perspective, that could make a lot of sense. Would it immediately be, even though they have connections to very beady eyes, burning a hole into the back of Brian Dable? Yes, it would. That being the case. If you're the New York football giants, if you're John Mara, do you hate the idea of having a safety valve in place? Like, I, I think it probably creates a little more chaos than stability. It doesn't mean that in a world that you could do it and you and you could tell me it was all going to be kumbaya, I probably would <clears> go with it. I actually find the Vrabel one to be a little bit more interesting because if he's not getting a head coaching job right now and it doesn't look like even a year from now that he sees the landscape and, and could get a good opportunity, et cetera. I do wonder about the idea, like, is he in a place where he'd say, oh, I'll take a step back here, quote unquote, to a D.C. role. I, I find both these guys, to put it bluntly, like I find them both very attractive options for the Giants as a defensive coordinator. So I, I think there's more legs to Mike Vrabel. I, I personally yeah, think yeah. It, in this Bill situation. Bill go make a ton of money in the booth somewhere, by it, the way, because whatever he is behind the podium, you, you go watch the, they do like the, you know, top 100 and he sits there and discusses players. He's affable. He's, he's, he reflects on guys in glowing ways. He's very detailed. He's very personable. You saw his exit interview from the Patriots. Like you got that little glint of it. He'll go make a ton of money in the booth and it'll be that classic. Are you going to be able to lure him back out? I think he wants to, if there isn't another head coaching job for him here this off season, he so, wants to be coaching again, but you remember Bill Cower, right? Oh, oh, just you wait, just you wait for the opportunity. He's like, I'm making so much money sitting here talking at halftime for 10 minutes. But also, I don't think, uh, and so while I would like Mike Vrabel, I don't think that it benefits him to take the Giants defensive coordinator position because 
I don't I, I don't think the or risk reward, elevate him at all, even in a step back. It doesn't even make sense for him. You may as well just sit out the year, make boatloads of cash in the booth, and the second someone gets fired. In week eight of the season, you are the number one candidate. If you take the Giants job, then you have to wait until the offseason to do it. To me, it doesn't it doesn't really make sense for him. Like he's not gonna gain more cachet by being the defensive coordinator of the Giants. Like sit out and be in the booth giving insightful things and let people fawn over you when they get grow tired of their head coach. Only difference there, I would say, is that typically when a coach is fired in season, the interim head coach is usually internal. Right. You fire the head coach, an offensive coordinator, a DC gets elevated for the year. Saw this with Antonio Pierce. Then he lands that full time job. So if you're Vrabel now, again, do I think it's likely that ends up what plays out for the Giants? If you took that role? No. Do I think I'm trying to think of a team that would be a good example of this that exists right now? Maybe there's not really they have to wait to see. Maybe some other jobs open up. Do I think there's a role out there right now as a defensive coordinator where he could be in line to then get an interim head coaching role if things don't go great? Sure. I, I, at the end of the day, it could just be wishful shopping, right? Like, yes, I would take Bill Belichick. I would take Mike Vrabel as the defensive coordinator. More than likely, they are both for, at different levels and for different reasons saying, where's the next head coaching gig? What do I have to do to be ready for one of those? Last thing that I just can't get out of my mind that makes me laugh, Adam, is this. Picture, it's week five. Mm -hmm. The Giants are one in three. <laughs> right. Brian Dable's pacing up and down the sideline. And turns to his defensive coordinator, Bill Belichick, and says, you're blowing this game. You're going to blow this game That's for right. us, Bill. Don't do this to us, Bill Belichick. Like, could you imagine the scene of Brian Dable being as, like, boisterous and outrageous and yelling and screaming at, at an accomplished coach that has given him opportunities in the pros? Like, to me, I just can't even fathom what that would even look like. <laughs> I also did just picture Bill Belichick from underneath the, you know, the hoodie on that sideline. The one thing I would say in that vein is to your point, go ahead. Tell me, Brian, Brian Dable, that you are going to be on your headset telling Bill Belichick you're going to lose this game for us. I dare you. Like, I dare I dare you to have the courage to do that. So it would be a fascinating thing. Maybe there's a little part of me. It's like, hey, let's spice it up a little bit. Let's have some fun. Notably here, too, just uh, from Jordan Renan over on Twitter, I will say he, had, uh, he put out a tweet earlier this morning. A look at the Giants defensive coordinator search. Denard Wilson, a lot to like. Jerome Henderson, the best chance for some continuity. Anthony Campanelli, can he be pried away from the Dolphins? And then Shane Bowen, actual play calling experience. So if we go beyond some of these name cache guys, there is a short list right now that for different reasons has some real value and should be exciting for the Giants to take a look at. We'll continue to update that as we move along. Here's the other good stuff, though, too, buddy. Fun little conversation happened both at the time and then during the season and then after the season and will continue through this offseason. And that was how Joe Shane and the Giants handled having both Daniel Jones contract and Saquon Barkley. Right. And the debate was which order should you do it in? Who's more valuable? What's the price point going to be? Kayvon Thibodeau, he had a bit of a conversation with Carmelo Anthony on his podcast, where, by the way, a lot of media outlets chose and uh, personalities chose to report this, I, I think in the exact way you do when you're trying to get some clicks, which is to leave out the part where Thibodeau says, I believe in Daniel Jones. But the crux of it was, I think based on play, based on production, based on what he me meant to the offense in that playoff season, 30% over 30% of the offense, Saquon Barkley should have been taken care of first, even symbolically. Let's just point stop right there. Can you appreciate where Thibodeau is coming from if it represents the consensus of the locker room and the way they feel about Saquon Barkley. Sure. Players record. <laughs> sure. Players totally. recognize that Saquon Barkley is talented. He is an all pro talent when he has been healthy. He has been electric for the Giants over the years. He is the straw that stirs the drink for the Giants on offense. Like, I totally get why Kayvon is saying that. And, and clearly, it feels like that is the undertone in the locker room is that Saquon is a baller. He is a freak athlete and we want him here long-term. No qualms at all with, say, with, with Kayvon Thibodeau saying that. Oh, point stop. So you're, uh, the flip side of this then, I should say, because this is where it comes into it. There's two factors here. One is, a as we know, like one thing did not dictate the other, right? And the difference here being about if you wanted to go the other way, you go back and look at the contract. Remember, because of the way they were able to structure Daniel Joe's contract, that first year had an at a sub-20 cap hit. 
going the other way, if you had franchise tagged him and signed Saquon Barkley, not that that's what Thibodeau necessarily said should have been the process, right? Maybe you wanted them both to get paid. But if you had gone that route, as we had discussed back then, you'd be talking about $37.5 million on the books for Daniel Jones. What's the trickle-down effect of that? You go into looking at free agency, all of a sudden the New York football giants are not necessarily able to go sign a Bobby O'Karake the following offseason. The money structure could have been shifted here, which would have prevented the Giants from making different decisions last offseason, this past offseason, and going forward. Sometimes, I think, as you mentioned there, it's like, yeah, it's great. Of course, everyone loves Saquon Barkley. He's exactly what you want. We said face of the franchise. There's nothing about Saquon Barkley not to like. But it's easy to get lost in the weeds of what gets impacted in other areas if you make certain decisions symbolically versus financially even though this all falls underneath the umbrella of we all agree mistake obviously the contract with daniel jones does it you know looks that way now a two years later or so adam the, the reason why i said full stop is has a lot to do with what what you just said but but let's let's peel back the onion just a little bit more mm-hmm. the reason why i'm fine with cave on thibodeau saying that is because he's a player who sits next to saquon barkley all day and right. wants players to get paid and sees that he's super talented regardless of positional value and all of those other things. He doesn't care about that. He sees Saquon is amazing. I want Saquon here. Pay the man his money. Right. What? what so you mentioned two things. I'll, I'll, I'll say, let me let me continue on, on your first thought. Yes, they wanted to get a long-term deal done with Daniel Jones because they needed his cap hit to come down. It was going to be over $32 million if they franchise tag him. They saved $17 million against the cap this past year to be able to make free agency moves like, I don't know, Bobby O'Karake. Right. We would not have been able to get our, our inside linebacker if Daniel Jones was not restructured the way that you want. Now, other people can say, well, we should have let Daniel Jones walk and do other things and 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 change or move, you know, move the goalpost, right, right. so to speak. Kayvon's saying he believes in Daniel Jones and he thinks Daniel Jones should have gotten a contract. His, his gripe is that Saquon didn't get his contract first. And Adam, where Kayvon seems to forget is that like, the Giants offered Saquon Barkley multiple long-term contract extensions before they offered Daniel Jones a contract extension. So just the fact that Saquon didn't like it and didn't want to sign it, like some kind of accountability has to be held on Saquon, his agent, and others because it seems a little disingenuous to be like, Saquon, they should have offered Saquon first. It's like they did, he did not accept it. And, and also, too, it's like from a player perspective, it's basically like you, you, you could say, well, came on, they offered him a contract. Yeah, I'm talking about offering the right contract, right? Like, you know, from a player perspective, it's like, yeah, I'm saying don't offer him the three year, the whatever it is. That's, you know, maybe can be looked at as, well, that's disrespectful, right? Because I'm sure, by the way, Saquon Barkley was like, that money's not good enough, right? Now, we know it plays out. You look at the market and you say maybe that was a good value contract that Barkley should have taken at the time looking back. But in the moment. You, he comes out of it. Now you're in this offseason, by the way. This also is a little bit of speaking on behalf of a guy that you want to be back here, right? Players, regardless of if you're on the same team or others, it's players are in a group together and then ownership and teams are in a group together, no matter what. If you, if Kayvon Thibodeau is talking about a running back, talking about Derrick Henry, he's going to say, hey, that dude's been a stud. He deserves every dollar he can get. He should get paid. Why? Because it's a brotherhood amongst the players and then it's against ownership and against getting those dollars. So in this instance, too, that's probably what this comes down to as well is like, it should have been 15 million a year for Saquon Barkley over 40 years. You know, the money should have been big. It should have been juicy. This guy really matters. And anything less than that feels like you weren't doing a quote unquote in the right fashion. But look at, you know, time has shown that Joe Sheen was at least correct on the Saquon Barkley piece. Like you could criticize him about giving Daniel Jones a long-term extension. Fine. Uh, Obviously that did not play out well in year one. We'll see what happens, you know, in year two, if it can be turned around. But when you look at the, free agent running backs last year that signed the only one that got over six, six and a half million dollars is Dalvin cook. And that was on a one year deal late in the game. The, the most that and any released, running back, which was, yeah, yeah, the most that any running back got on a multi-year deal was six and a half million. So like well, when, you, when you look at this and you say the market is telling you, even when a 25 or 26 year old running back comes out on the market, they are just not worth 12 to 15 million dollars anymore and and adam I'll, I'll turn it back over to you but look at this free agent crop of austin eckler you look at ezekiel elliott's going to be there deandre swift is going to be there you know obviously saquon barkley's going to be there tony pollard's going to be there uh but you know josh jacobs is going to be there there's an influx of 25 to 28 year old running backs 
are people just going to be lining up to sign Saquon Barkley for $15 million a year this offseason when you could sign DeAndre Swift for a one-year $5 million deal? Like to, to me, the market has shown that this is the rate that it's going. And I'm wondering if if Saquon and his agent really over overplayed their hand. Well, two two notes on that from a Joe Shane perspective. First, on the running back, I, I, you can I, I think I, I agree with you in saying, "Hey, we can't overpay for you." That being the case, it actually applies to both of these players. If Saquon Barkley, they said, "Fine, go test the market. We want you back, but go let the market set your value." Right? And Saquon goes to market, and it is. It's ah, well, we'll give you seven million. They go great. So you want a three year deal? We'll give you. It will even give you eight. Right? And now we're talking about being four million underneath the tag and four and a half million underneath the offer we gave you, tried to give you on a three year deal. You can go that route and maybe you retain the value or you risk Saquon Barkley saying, sorry, like you, you didn't want to negotiate with me. You didn't want the long term deal. I'm going to go take less money elsewhere because now I feel like I've been scorned by my own franchise on the Daniel Jones side of it, too, though. What I wish you could do is go down the alternate universe because it is it is tricky. This past season was a mess. Nobody, in my opinion, was going to pay Daniel Jones a four-year, $160 million contract on the open market. However, that that Vikings game was a lot, right? That last season was a big step in the right direction for Jones. I would have been fascinated to look at the landscape of the NFL and say, what was some team going to give Daniel Jones? I think he would have gotten a contract offer. I think there would have been discussions. And at that point, I can probably look at, at, at Joe Shane and say, well, you may have done it wrong both ways, no matter which it was franchise tag or otherwise. You did it wrong because neither of these players on the open market for different reasons, position and value were ever going to come close to what you paid Saquon Barkley on the tag and what you paid Daniel Jones, even over the short term of two years out of the four with an out, right? There is a world where you had to have a little bit of fortitude to say, go ahead, let the market tell us what we have to pay you. And in the case of Daniel Jones, I think you could have said, oh, somebody offered you 40 million. That's okay. That would have been a walkaway number for the Giants and the fan base would have applauded it. <clears throat> for Saquon Barkley, it would have been a little bit harder, but you can make the case that that risk of walking into obscurity with no quarterback and no high-end running back, that was too much for the Giants, for Joe Shane, for John Mayer to say, you know what? Let's be prudent about this. Instead, they kind of backed themselves into a bit of a negotiating corner. Well, that this is going to be fascinating. This is why we spent so much time on our last episode talking about Baker Mayfield because he's in a very similar situation where it's like, mm -hmm. okay, Baker, if you go out there, if someone's willing to offer you forty million plus on a multi-term deal, like we can't match that. It it they, they are in a very similar situation where they either have to franchise tag him and, and eat up all their cap space, or they have to sign him long term. And then you turn around in a year and you're like, wow, we're six and eleven with Baker Mayfield. We over anticipated what he was going to be. Uh, yeah. The, the other thing with Saquon Barkley, the, the last thing I'll say on him mm -hmm. is I saw this be brought up and Dan Doggan said this is all, also what he said he would do is you go to Saquon Barkley this offseason and you say, look, we're going to have a handshake agreement. We agree to not put the franchise tag on you. And in, in that handshake agreement, in that gentleman's agreement, you give us the right of, of refusal. You go out on the market and see what number you can get from whoever is out there and available just give us an option to match it. Just give us an option to match it. We're going to give you the freedom. Give us the option to match it so that if your value is there, you can still be a giant and get the money that you want. I found that fascinating because it's almost like you're almost daring Saquon at that point. Like, go ahead. Like, go see what you can get. And if you really think you can get $15 million, then then really we, we are in two completely different places. And, and to be fair on that, which I think is an interesting approach and maybe a smart approach, I would say you probably have to have the handshake agreement be, and we'll give you a little bit more than what you get offered on the open market because it's the symbolic thing of we do, you know, and this is, this is really what it's been about for Saquon. It's the symbolic thing. Like I shouldn't have to beg and scrape my way to a, to a contract with the giants. If it's a quibble over, right? We said this, Hey, we'll give you 13 and a half million. Well, I want 14 and a half. Should the Giants really have balked at the $3 million extra dollars that 
probably ends up being no dollars if you cut off the back end of it in the third year, whatever it may be, right? A four-year deal that you can cut down and spread the money out. That's, I think, where Saquon Barkley's ultimate frustration is. It feels like you're nickel and diming your second overall in the draft pick, your face of the franchise, a guy that has grinded out through a lot of bad years in this franchise. And now when it comes up, you're unwilling to do that little bit extra. It, it is fascinating to me. We've talked about this from all angles. But like when it's not my money, <laughs> you're like, dude, what's right. I was going to say, Adam, when you when you go to the steakhouse and they have the different levels of steak and they're like, I'll take oh, Wagyu. the one you want, that's actually the Wagyu A5. <laughs> that's going to cost like $120 uh, per ounce. Do you want that? You're like, that's too rich for my blood. But it's like when it's the Giants money, you're like, well, if he goes and shops it around, they should still pay more than every other team in the league just as a, like a nice tip of the cat to say when Andy's like, picking up the tab i say top shelf baby top shelf all the way that's the way I, that's the way i roll but they did it with daniel jones though they were like hey buddy symbolic money 160 million so and that, had that, that work out end, had that work out here. <laughs> yeah yeah well yeah yeah and now they're like and we're only a season away from being done with that anyway we'll continue to cover this here obviously players support players and we appreciate that the last thing we need to do maybe the most important thing we need to do is talk about our pick em battle. Oh, guys, we said this before. Now, technically, I don't want to knock Andy here because he has not been terrible. You know, when you look at the numbers and you say Adam with a seismic 10 points, right? And you only have Andy sitting there at six points. Jeez, what a disaster. But he's actually picked pretty well. He's just allocated his points horrifically. Now that we're into the championship round, three points and two points to allocate. We'll both be picking both games. So Andy doesn't need to go strategy here and just pick against me. I think it's actually going to be easier for him to do this because I think we're going to disagree on these games coming in. Kansas City at Baltimore. They've already proven they can be the road warrior. Kansas City is getting three and a half. Andy, I let you pick this game first because I 1000% know which way you're going. Well, listen, I appreciate you mentioning the asterisks about my picks and the Buffalo Bills game getting moved with the blizzard and all of that stuff. No, it wasn't so about that. You, Sorry, no. That no thank you, that thank you for that making sure that we emphasize that there's asterisks around everything. Yeah. That That's helpful for the listeners to have context. So thank you for that. Sure. Now, when we get to the Kansas City Chiefs and the Ravens, I know why you're doing this. I know exactly why you're doing this. And I, I there's nothing I can do about it. There's literally nothing I can do. Because, Adam, you are someone that is a little bit more flexible than I am. I think you you you're really good at like pivoting off of things more than I am. I I see something and I stick with it for a long time until I'm proven incredibly foolish at some point down the road. Yeah. I Somewhat just can't some would say. I said the same thing in the last game where yeah. the Kansas City Chiefs were on the road against the Bills. I'm like I just can't bet against Patrick Mahomes in the playoffs. You shouldn't. Especially getting more than a field goal. I I mm-hmm. just can't do it. Until I see it with my own eyes that someone other than Tom Brady and that one time with Joe Burrow beats him and, and and makes him look foolish, I just can't do it again. 12 and three. I think he's now 13 and three in the playoffs. He's like eight and three as an underdog. He's unbelievable. I, I have a feeling that you're going to go with the team that's looked the best in the league, the team that has the MVP, and the team that has the best potential defense left in the Baltimore Ravens. But give me the Kansas City Chiefs. Yeah, I mean, I knew you were going to go in that direction. Now, that wasn't going to change my opinion on this one, which, by the way, I, I I said that I probably would have laid the points with the Bills a week ago, and I would have lost that game if I was picking it um, because it just felt like there was an opportunity there for them. That being said, and you can look at Josh Allen and his performance, the one thing from last week that I do look at and think about is – you got to remember that that defense for the Buffalo Bills was pretty darn banged up, right? Like there were a lot of factors inside of that game that, by the way, no excuses. Patrick Mahomes played better than Josh Allen, like Kansas City Chiefs, better, better than the Bills. They won the game, right? But there were a lot of things there. Conversely, for the Baltimore Ravens, Mark Andrews maybe going to make his way back here. You got some young rookie talents in Zay Flowers, and you have Lamar Jackson. I think that we, we've talked about him over the course of this podcast over the years. Where does he really rank? Is he really that good? You know, is, is he truly one of the top X quarterbacks in the league? He is. And, and I think that you're going to get one of the maybe more surprising showcases here. It has been Allen and Mahomes, right? It has been Joe Burrow surging over the, in recent years. And Lamar, to me, almost feels like the forgotten quarterback in the AFC. They have been the better team. They've been arguably the best team quietly all year. And I just think that you're going to see Kansas City, who's had a lot of struggles, specifically on offense. I think you're going to see those those struggles come to bear. 
I'm not talking about blowout city here, right? I'm not saying watch out Baltimore. I think the over under is set at 44 and a half in this game. I'm not talking about, you know, 31, 17 Baltimore necessarily, but I do think Baltimore wins this game. I do think they are going to be going to the big game ultimately. So I will take Baltimore in this one. I will lay the three and a half. Were you putting three points on this or two points, sir? Uh, you know what? It's tough because because on you one be hand, bullish about this? Shouldn't you be yeah, saying, I, of course, it's my three-point play because I believe in Patrick Mahomes. I'm never, I'm never been proven wrong about how good he is. Three-point play, Patrick Mahomes. If I'm gonna put three points down, it's gonna, you're sure, you, you, you're, it's definitely gonna be on someone like Patrick Mahomes. I'll tell you that. I'm gonna make. So let let I'll, let's make things interesting, right? I'll make it my two-point play, and then I'll make my three-point play inside of the Detroit game. Now, the Detroit game going to San Francisco. Plus seven and a half over under is 51 and a half. A lot of people believe when you look at this game that after watching the Tampa Bay Detroit matchup, you say, yes, Detroit. Wow. What a great story. Winning multiple playoff games, games at home. What an electric stadium there at Ford Field. Epic. But the fact that that game was as close as it was for as long as it was means that they are clearly a tier below San Francisco. That might be true. But I also think that you st- ultimately when you watch that last game for Detroit, what happened in the end? They pulled away. What happened in the end? They won that game. Seven and a half is a really big number. So I'm going to take Detroit with the seven and a half to cover this. I would not, if we're talking outright, be too bullish about them getting the win on the road. But, but if I'm talking about these two quarterbacks, man, maybe no Debo, there's going to be no Debo Samuel, Samuel or significantly banged up Debo Samuel. I don't hate the idea of looking at how Jared Goff has played throughout the playoffs and his overall career track record and putting that up against Brock Purdy. So I'm going to take as my three point play Detroit Lions seven and a half, baby. Yeah, I think we both felt like we knew what the other was going to pick in this one. And and I completely understand the reason why. Listen, Brock this could Purdy, be a travesty, by the way, I could be losing after the championship weekend if this goes the wrong way. Well, I mean, so you clearly know that I I am going to pick the San Francisco 49ers even after they lost they lost me the game, you know, in terms of the spread last week against the Green Bay Packers. And it it really comes down to one thing. I think Brock Purdy looked very shaky for that game. It was a a, a rain game. Obviously didn't look good, but when the chips were on the table, he he performed well. Yep. Got them down the field and they scored. Now, seven and a half is a lot of points in a playoff game. But Adam what would you say is the weakest of either of these teams? If you had to point to like one weakness that you think is the biggest weakness across both of these teams, Detroit and, and the 49ers, what would yeah, you think? Detroit defense and specifically Detroit, Detroit secondary. Correct. Detroit gave up the second most passing yards per game Not in the problem. league. They were only they were only ahead of the Washington Commanders, who felt like people were were throwing for like 500 yards against them. Detroit's secondary is just beat up. And if you believe that Debo is going to play and you think Brandon Ayuk is going to be there and you think Christian McCaffrey can catch the ball out of the backfield, you think Kittle can be there. To me, it feels like Brock Purdy has an opportunity to exploit a defense where like it's tailor made for him. He's not going up against the Ravens secondary. He's going up against one of the worst secondaries in the league. So who knows? I think maybe San Francisco at home gets out to a big lead. Maybe that defense gets to pin their ears back. That's the way that I see it being a 10 to 13 point win for San Francisco. Yeah. AFC matchup here, more maybe exciting just in terms of like, hey, I think this thing's going to be back and forth. I think you're going to see some explosive plays. You have defenses that can make big moments, right? So that one seems like it could be on paper even more exciting. To your point, just about the Detroit San Francisco, for me, it's like, okay, Detroit gets the opening kickoff. A nice solid drive, right? Put put the touchdown on the board early. At least make it a situation where San Francisco has to climb back in and then try to get over the top on, right? So much about this is going to be game script. The, the, the Detroit Lions, while Jared Goff has timely, Dan Campbell showed a lot of confidence in him, they need the ground game to work, right? So San Francisco run defense. If they can shut down the running game for Detroit, all of a sudden things get a little bit different. So bumping a team off their game script, off their identity, that's what matters a lot here. And it's funny, while you'd say Detroit, and we talked about this last week, chose to make a part of their defensive identity stopping the run, the the, the, the terrible thing about, about Christian McCaffrey is, well, he could run the ball three times in a game and still go for 100 plus yards because of how good he is and how versatile he is. So it makes for a fascinating matchup, man. I, I, I can't wait for it. This is this has been a really good couple of weeks of football, I think. You know, the, the divisional round gave a lot of good games overall. Championship round, is it the teams we all thought would be there? Maybe, maybe not. 
But these are two really good matchups that I think in the end will give two really good games. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, at it the end of the feels day. like we got the four best teams throughout the course of the season. It really yeah, one does. Versus three, like, one versus three, right? Yeah, well, yeah. And, and the whole thing is like, we kind of knew the Buffalo Bills had the win out to get in, but they were a flawed team with so many injuries. We kind of were like, oh, here are the Cowboys, but the Cowboys were the same old Cowboys when push came to shove. <laughs> Detroit started that opening game beating the defending champion Kansas City Chiefs. You felt like you might be able to see them in the mix later. We have them again. This, to me, is the four best teams, and I feel like this is going to be an amazing weekend of football. You better believe it. We will, of course, be back in talking about what happened over the weekend. We've also got something, some exciting stuff coming next week. We're going to break down free agency for the New York football giants. How many free agents do they have? I think it's 73. We're going to go through them and talk about who's going to be back, who should be back, who shouldn't be back, where they can improve, where the cap stands. So that's coming middle of next week. On Monday, though, we'll dive in on takeaways from this. And if there's any key free agents or coaches that we could be looking at to improve this roster and this staff, in the off season until next time over on YouTube at one giant podcast over on Twitter at one giant podcast at Andy Mac two fourteen and at Adam Armbrecht and on those podcast feeds, wherever you get those needs fulfilled as Andrew Makowitz until next time would want nay need demand messed it up for the first time in a while. The people know as always let's go big blue.